Let's stand this morning, church.
We invite you in, oh God. We invite you in, oh Lord. Breathe upon this place.
draw a boundary. Against every weapon that's formed. A thief in his plans will pass over. When he sees the red on the door, I bleed the blood. I bleed the blood of Jesus. I bleed the blood. stand in this place and worship God.
that one more time. Would you lift your hands today? Come on, are you grateful this morning? Can we give him a round of applause this morning? Can we thank him? Can we worship you? We honor you. Jesus, this morning, we're so grateful, each one of us, Lord, as we take this opportunity to just reflect on uh, today, your death and your burial, and Lord, your shed blood and what that means for us as individuals. And Lord, we're so grateful today for the blood that's applied to us, Lord, we can experience moments like this that allow us to come boldly into your presence today in Jesus' name. If you're there, would you say amen? amen? Amen. Hey, why don't you turn around really quickly and say good morning to someone as you're being seated. Thank you, Dad. Well, good morning. Are you doing good today? It's great to see you. Um, you know, this is obviously, it's a special day, and, and I'm excited to uh, get to just share a, a few short, uh, short thoughts today. If you have a Bible, would you turn in it to uh, Luke chapter 22? Luke chapter 22, I'm going to read verses 14 uh, to 20 today. It's the account of the institution of the Lord's Supper, what we call communion. We may refer to it as the Eucharist as well. Uh, but Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 20, I'm going to read some verses here and then we'll get into it. And this is what it says. It says, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, he being Jesus. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it uh, until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray really quickly. Lord, today, thank you again just for these moments that we get to reflect. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, just encourage our hearts through your word today, and just as we kind of commemorate your burial today and your death. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, how many parents are in the room today? <laughs> yeah, here we go. All right. Yeah, this guy knows what it's like to be a parent. Man. Um, how many of you have said to your kids at one time or another, I can't wait for you to be a parent? Have you ever said that? You know, I remember my parents saying that to me, and it was kind of like, like them saying, you know, you're going to get it one day. You know, you're going to get it one day. And, uh, and it's true, you know, I remember, uh, I remember coming home and, and, you know, I'd give my mom my, my, my clothes and uh, my uniform clothes when I was in, in, in school, in elementary school specifically, and I'd play soccer at lunchtime, right, so they have grass stains on them and, uh, you know, I, I'd go to school the very next day after they'd been freshly washed and I'd come home with new grass stains, you know, and my mom, oh, I can't wait for you to be a parent one day, you know, she'd say that. And, uh, you know, my dad, too, you know, uh, you know, I played soccer, and he'd have to, you know, I'd tell him, hey, Dad, you know, my game's in Surrey, 10 a.m., so I know you're a chicken farmer, so you got to be up at, like, 5 a.m. to go to work so that you can take me to my game on Saturday. You know, well, I can't wait for you to be a parent one day. You know, and I've discovered that my kids, they're just, they're me. They are me now. You know, uh, Jax has no regard for his personal safety or the laundry. And uh, Scarlett, you know, I, I feel like the older she gets, we just become a personal chauffeur service for her. Do you parents feel like that? Like, it's just a chauffeur service for your kids, you know? It's, it's painful from time to time. And uh, my wife and I, we were driving in the car the other day, and uh, I turned around. I can't even remember what happened with my kids, but I turned around, and I looked at my kids, and I said, I can't wait for you to be a parent one day. 
And I was like, oh boy, I've turned into my mom and dad, you know. Uh, but the reality is, you know, the, re the reality is there are certain things that, uh, that don't make sense until time kind of unfolds, you know. There, there's certain things that we don't comprehend fully, uh, whether it's things that we experience in life or whether it's uh, things that have been said to us that don't make sense in the moment. And, and it's kind of like, it, it's kind of another way of saying, like, you'll get it one day. You'll get it one day. And I imagine that this is kind of what's taking place in, in this moment right now that we read about it, well, that we read about with the disciples. I don't think that they fully understand or comprehend what's taking place. You know, of course, Jesus had alluded to his death a number of times when uh, he was with them. But for whatever reason, the disciples, they didn't fully uh, grasp it, right? And so here they are, they're celebrating the Passover, and, and, and I, I, would, I would guess that they understood the historical significance of what, they, of what was taking place. You know, the Jewish people, they would celebrate the Passover uh, yearly, and, and what they're doing, they're, they're celebrating their, their deliverance, the nation of Israel's deliverance from Egypt by, by a mighty hand. Uh, from God. And, and it was worth celebrating. You know, they have this, this rich history, uh, this national identity that they, kind of, that they kind of get as a result of the Passover. And you guys know the story. You know, 400 years of slavery and God raises up this deliverer, Moses, and it's the 10 plagues that kind of, they culminate in the plague on the firstborn son. And, and, and God tells the people of Israel through Moses, he says, okay, well, you're going to kill a lamb and you're going to take the blood of that lamb and you're going to put it on your doorpost. And when the lamb or when the, the angel passes through uh, the nation of Egypt, when he sees this blood of the lamb on the doorpost, the, the, the lamb or the, the angel will know to pass over that house to spare your, force, your, your firstborn. So deliverance, again, it kind of gives them the sense of, of, of national identity. You know, they have this rich history that they had had prior to that point with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But here they are, they're, they're stuck in this nation of Egypt. And so this deliverance, this Passover, kind of gives them a national identity. But here we are, years later, all this time, now celebrating this Passover, Jesus with his disciples. And it's a nation that's experienced a tremendous amount of turmoil. You know, they've uh, enslaved in the nation of Egypt, they've been captive in, in Babylon and Assyria, and now they're oppressed. They feel oppressed, we should say that. They feel oppressed at the hands of the Romans. And, and oppression at, at the hands of a nation was one thing, and it was no doubt a contentious issue for the Jews, you know, because they feel like we're, we're, we're kind of back to where we started in Egypt. And they hoped that this Messiah that had been predicted was going to be this military deliverer that's going to come and just defeat the Romans and usher in this new kingdom. That's what they hope for. And here they are celebrating this Passover again with no doubt a tremendous amount of pride and gratitude, but still kind of feeling like history is just sort of repeating itself. So here we are, opposition at the hands of this other nation being one thing. But you think about it, Jesus actually came to deal with a different kind of oppression. And how many times do we experience that in our own lives, though? We want Jesus to be something other than what he actually came to be. You know, I want Jesus to be the deliverer of my finances, and, and, and he can be. He is our provider. I want Jesus to heal this issue in my body, or I want Jesus to take care of this need. But oftentimes, Jesus actually comes to be something other than maybe what we want in the moment. Jesus comes to be what we need. So Jesus, they were hoping that he would deal with the, the oppression of a nation, and Jesus was actually coming to deal with the, the oppression of sin in the, in the people's lives. And I'm not sure that as these disciples are taking the Passover, experiencing or, or taking part in Passover with Jesus, I'm not sure that they actually knew that Jesus was about to become their Passover lamb. I don't think they understood that. So in Egypt, it was the blood of the lamb that would spare the firstborn, or spare God's wrath on the firstborn, and, 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 and now in Israel it would be the blood of the Lamb that would spare humanity from the wrath of God on sin. It's interesting to me, you know, it, it, it's this culmination of all this time in, in the land of Egypt, and, and the plague of the firstborn finally is, is God's wrath on the nation of Egypt. You know, Scripture describes Jesus in, I think it's in Romans chapter 8, it describes him as the firstborn of many brothers. And it's interesting to me that God's wrath was poured out on, on the firstborn of Egypt. And here we have God's wrath being satisfied in the firstborn of many brothers. Our brother. Our brother. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Passover lamb, in, or the Passover in a number of ways. And first it was this, he became the lamb. He became the lamb. In Exodus chapter 12, you know, we see the institution of the Passover. And, and time progresses, and you see as they wander through the wilderness, there's different sacrifices that are 
that are kind of instituted, and we see the requirements for all these things. And in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 11 to 18, uh, it talks about how the priest would actually stand continually to make these sacrifices. Think about that for a moment. There were the morning and evening offerings. There were sin offerings that they would make. There were different uh, feasts and festivals where they would make different offerings. There was the Day of Atonement. There were special sacrifices that they would have to make. I mean, if you consider this for a moment, imagine being a priest in that day. You know, being a priest in that day is not what we uh, would imagine being a priest being like. You know, when we picture a priest today, we picture someone maybe with a white collar or someone sitting uh, in a confession booth and saying, you know, I bless you, my child, you know, or say 10 Hail Marys and, and, and you're forgiven, you're absolved of your sin and here's your penance. That's kind of what we think of a priest being. You know, these priests, they would offer these continual sacrifices. You imagine... Uh, you know, uh, for, for a sin offering, they, they, there were these requirements that they would have to make. And imagine your neighbor, you know, Monday, he's in to see the priest for this one issue. And, hey, I need to offer a lamb for this thing I did. And then, you know, three or four days later, he's back seeing the priest again. I need to make a sin offering for this thing right here, too. You know, you imagine even in your own life, you think of the different things that you struggle with. And you think of how often you would have to go see a priest to make a sacrifice for a sin that you had committed. And keep in mind that the nation of Israel was, was likely around two million people. Two million people. And of course, the priests, they served in different, uh, different, uh, different regions, and they served different communities of people. But you think, okay, well, two million people, that's a lot of sin that's happening. You know, there's a lot of, and, and, and it's not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily completely how it happened. But the point is, sacrifices were being constantly offered. These priests, is it, and it's not to say that 24 hours a day and seven days a week, these guys never got a break. They were always slaughtering lambs, you know. They, they, but these guys, the, the point is, these guys had to keep making sacrifices. There was no end to the things that they had to do to satisfy sin. And it talks about, in Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about how these, these, these sacrifices that were made could, could make nobody perfect. They could make no one perfect. There was still this awareness, and it, and it alludes to this actually in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. It alludes to this, this consciousness of sin that the people of Israel still had. You know, if, if we're making all of these sacrifices day by day, if we're making these morning and evening sacrifices, if we're offering these sin sacrifices, why is it that I still sense a consciousness or a guilt for the sin that I've committed? And that's kind of what Hebrews is trying to communicate. And Hebrews 10 goes on to say this. Jesus offered a single sacrifice and sat down. A single sacrifice and sat down. Think of that, where these priests, they would offer day after day sacrifices and they would continually stand because the work could never be done in the sacrifices that they were offering. And Jesus offered one single sacrifice and sat down. If I can't put my hope, if we can't put our hope in the shed blood of Jesus, there is no sacrifice for sin. But thank God that his blood is enough for us. Amen? Amen. Second way that he fulfilled the Passover is this, deliverance and redemption. The nation of Israel was delivered uh, from the hands of, from, from oppression in Egypt. And we today were delivered from the bondage and the oppression of sin. Think of that. We know that there's a penalty or a punishment for sin. That makes sense to us. You know, you, you do the crime, you do the time. It, it makes sense to us. Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 23, it says that the wages of sin is death. There's a punishment. There's a penalty that needs to be paid for sin. And we know that Jesus' blood satisfies God's wrath, and I can experience forgiveness for my sin, and it cleanses me. But not only that, it's not just the thing that spares me. Jesus' blood also has the power to deliver me from the bondage and the hold that sin has on my life. I don't need to live in bondage to my sin because the blood of Jesus can actually set me free. And the last thing today is this, the new covenant. I don't want to invite the worship team to come up. I know you guys just sat down and I apologize, but I'm going to call you back up. I just saw Noah and Jonas literally sit down about 30 seconds ago. The new covenant. You read about uh, the sacrificial system and the priests, they would offer these various sacrifices, but one man, one time of year, would get to go into the Holy of Holies, and he would offer atonement on behalf of the entire nation of Israel. And there were these specific instructions that were carefully laid out and kind of curated for this, for this priest to go in. You know, he had to do these certain things in order to, uh, to satisfy the requirements here. And scripture des describes Jesus in Hebrews as our great high priest the mediator of this new covenant. And scripture says that we can have a full assurance of faith. 
to enter God's presence with boldness. And this is amazing to me because you might remember uh, a few weeks ago, I, I was preaching on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and it talks about how Moses came down from the mountain and his face was shining, and it actually terrified the nation of Israel, terrified the people. Um, the reality is, is that there was a certain level of, of fear and reverence for the presence of God that the Israelite people experienced that maybe we don't experience in the same way today. And I'm not saying that we treat it casually and we treat it like it's ho-hum, but there was, there was literally, there was a level of terror that the people had to the presence of God. They were afraid to approach God. You know, you think about this, there's, there's certain Jewish literature and, and tradition, and I'm not saying take this to the bank as if it's the gospel, but there's certain Jewish tradition and literature that says this, that the high priest, when he would go into the Holy of Holies, uh, he would actually have bells on his robe. And these bells were to indicate to the people who would be standing outside the tabernacle, it was to indicate to the people that he was actually still alive. So as he walked, as he fulfilled his duties of atonement, his bells would be ringing as he walked through into the Holy of Holies. Further tradition, it actually says that they would, they would actually tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest. And so they would know, okay, well, if the bell stops ringing, it's actually possible that the high priest has, has died in the presence of God. Maybe he offered something in the wrong way, or maybe his, he himself was not pure. He was not in a condition to approach God. He didn't make atonement for himself in the right way, and he approached a holy God and was struck dead. And so now we need to pull him out of the Holy of Holies. And you keep in mind, this is, this is what the people of Israel thought of the presence of God. It was a terrifying thing for them to consider approaching a holy God. You consider even uh, uh, Aaron's sons who offered profane fire before the Lord, and it says that fire consumed these two young men. You consider, uh, I think it's Uzzah in, in First or Second Samuel where he uh, goes to steady the Ark of the Covenant because it, it looks like it's about to fall over it. He reaches out and touches the Ark of the Covenant, and God strikes him dead because he treated the presence of the Lord in a casual way. This is the way that the people of Israel were taught to revere the presence of God. And so for scripture to say then that we can approach with boldness God's presence, this would have been a, a monumental thought for the people of Israel to think that because of the shed blood of Jesus, I can actually approach God's throne with boldness. And this is what Jesus is talking about to these young men in the moments before he'll give his life, where he says, this is the cup that is the new covenant in my blood. And this is what they wouldn't have understood completely. This is this moment where it's kind of like, you'll get it one day, his body and blood, his death, the tearing of the temple curtain, his resurrection, his ascension, all these things would have continued to make more and more sense as time passed, even as the temple was destroyed some 40 years later. The Passover lamb, this Passover lamb became the way through which we can relate to God, the way, the way through which we can all be reconciled. And not only did it satisfy God's wrath, it invites us in today. It invites us in. You know, I saw this clip. I was telling Pastor Justin about it uh, this morning before we started the service. And um, I got to be honest, I saw this clip and I just, I cried. It was so beautiful. Um, this man, uh, Paul Washer, he was, if some of you maybe heard of him, he was recounting the story of a young, of a young man. He was uh, giving a lecture and on, on the atonement, and this young man asked him, he said, how can one man suffering for a few short hours on a cross satisfy and deliver a multitude of men from an eternity of judgment? And Paul Washer's response to him was this, he said, because that one man is greater than all men put together. And he said, if you take everything that brings beauty or delight in the earth today, and if you put that on one side of the scale and you put Jesus on the other scale, he outweighs them all. And that is how one man suffering on a tree for a few short hours can deliver us from an eternity of judgment. You know, we commemorate this time of year, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, and, and I don't know about you, maybe it's just me, but it's really easy to just kind of go through the motions of, of another weekend, you know, it's, and, and enjoy the days off, to be honest. You know, it's great to have Friday and Monday off if you get Monday off too. 
it's easy to just kind of go through the motions without a fully appreciating the sacrifice. You know, what was really a brutal day for Jesus on our behalf and the willingness yet of him to suffer on my behalf. And my hope for me today and for you is David prayed, you know, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Lord, give me another revelation. You know, I've had him before, but Lord, give me a fresh revelation of what this cost you and let there be a great appreciation in my heart for what your death accomplished for me. I want to take communion together as, as Jesus did with his disciples here. And uh, if you don't have the, the emblems to take communion, would you just uh, raise your hand really quickly? We have some people that would be happy to pass them out to you. If you're walking around right now, just keep your hand up really high until we can get them to you. I only see a couple. Before we do that today, I want to just take a moment of reflection for all of us in the room here today. You know, the reality is these, these guys, these disciples are, you know, they don't completely know what they're doing in, in taking communion and, and celebrating Jesus as the Passover lamb. And here we are on the other side, some 2,000 later, 2,000 years later, celebrating the death of Jesus or commemorating the death of Jesus that invites us in. And I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment here to just take a moment to consider the broken body of Jesus and his spilt blood today. And I want you to just ask yourself this question as we prepare to take communion. Just ask yourself this question today. Where would I be without Jesus? Where would I be without Jesus? took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and he gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me can we take this together Likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Can we take this together? I'm going to invite you to stand. wondering if, in, in just in your own words, would you just begin to lift, would you just lift your hands and begin to, to just thank the Lord, just thank him for the blood that he shed today, thank him for his, his broken body, as scripture says, come on, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him today, come on, just lift up your worship to him today, thank him, thank him for his blood today, thank him that we get to come into his presence with boldness, with confidence, come on, we thank you, Lord, we honor you today, God, we worship you, Lord lift you up, God. We thank you, Jesus.
Amen. Can you give Jesus just a, for a moment, just honor him. Let's lift him up. Come on, just for five more seconds, just give him praise today. Let's exalt him. Jesus, we love you today. We love you today, Lord. We love you today, God. Come on, we know that scripture. It says that where two or three are gathered, that I am there in the midst of him. And so we don't just go through the motions today or remember something that happened way in the past. It doesn't have relevance for this exact moment. He's here with us. Jesus is here with us. Come on, when you get that revelation, isn't your heart just filled with such gratitude and joy? Come on, thinking of what he did, and yet he's right here. His eyes are on us this morning as we worship him and lift him up. And, and I pray that as we start this weekend, that the reality of that grips your heart. Such a thankfulness in your heart for the goodness of God in my life and the, the presence of Jesus that is with me, that lifts up my eyes beyond the circumstances and the things that are around me. And there's such a gratefulness and thankfulness for him. Aren't you grateful today? Come on, just for five more seconds, can you put your hands together? Just tell Jesus how much you love him. Jesus, we worship you. Come on, we lift you up. You're awesome in this place. We thank you, your people, we thank you today. We thank you today in your mighty name, in your mighty name. As, as we close today, you know, what's in my heart is that maybe you're here today. You know, the reality of the blood of Jesus is that it sets us free. It brings life, it brings healing, it brings hope into our life. And I just want to extend the invitation. If you're here today and you want to prayer for maybe there's something in your life, maybe you are contending for healing in your body. Maybe there's something that's heavy in your heart that you know that Jesus can break through. And I just want to open up the front. If, if as we close today, if you would like prayer for any of those things, you just want that blood, the reality of that in your life today, would you come to the front? And leaders, uh, would you just be aware of that this morning? If, if people are coming up, let's just surround them in prayer and in faith because his blood is powerful and mighty and his presence works miracles in our lives today. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray for you as you go today, and let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much. Father, words have been spoken today that just fill our hearts, God, with a gratitude for what you've done, for who you are. And today we recognize you as King and as Lord, even though we remember today the, the journey that you took to the cross and in the tomb. God, we know the end of the story, and we know that you're here with us this morning and that you're alive and present in our lives. And so we come with grateful hearts today. We say thank you. We, we love this weekend because it is the cornerstone of our faith and it gives us such joy and hope in our lives. So we say thank you today. Come in our hearts. Come and stir afresh in us today. Come over this weekend and spark a fresh fire within our spirit, Lord, of, of who you are and the presence of, of your spirit in our lives and our hearts, God. We invite you to do that and we love you and give you all the glory. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. We look forward to Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. So come, invite some friends, invite people that don't know Jesus, because we're going to have opportunity for them to receive him. So God bless you. If you would like prayer, come forward. If not, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we will see you on Sunday. Thank you.